I used to work in a work in a church office, and uh, uh, when we'd have coffee, um, if the pastors wanted to stop me from talking, they would just hold my hands down, and guess what? It worked every time. So, um, I just like to, before I begin, just to thank you for this opportunity to uh, share my story. Uh, thank you for all the people that prayed for me. I have just had the most calm <laughs> time leading up to this. Um, it's just been unbelievable. You know who you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the people that prayed even today for me. I, I just appreciate that so much. And I've been helping prepare the meals in the kitchen. Thank you to the wonderful ladies there. I've just, I've just got to know so many wonderful people just by helping in the kitchen, and thank you so much for that. And I guess I'd like to say a special hello to all my Elam friend ladies, and hello downstairs, ladies. We're with you. <laughs> and lastly, I, I will try to control my hands, but I'm making no promises, so... My walk with Christ was initiated when I was about 12 years old, when I accepted Christ as my savior when I went to camp. Just a little plug for supporting camp. It's amazing what seeds can be planted at camp. But coming home to an environment where my faith was not nurtured, it was shelved for many years. But I never, ever lost that desire to know God in a deep way. The seed was planted, and although it took a long time for it to grow, I look back as that, that time at that camp, even though I didn't understand it all as the beginning point of my faith journey. Seeds sometimes take a long time to grow, but he who began a good work will bring it to completion. Due to some God-ordained circumstances, being a new mom and longing to solidify this sensitivity to the things of God, it finally became clear to me and to my understanding that I needed to accept Jesus as my Savior and that the, his shed blood on Calvary could offer me the forgiveness that I needed. I asked and I received. The Bible says, I chose you. You did not choose me. John 15, 16. Like many of you, I'm sure you love those moments in life where you feel like you're living on the mountaintop. Everything is going well, and praise God, he does let us visit those mountaintop experiences in our lives. But many of us know that that's not where the real living is on the mountaintop, but it is nice to visit. This is where I found myself when I was 17. Oh, oh my goodness, that sounds so long ago. Well, Gail, it actually was, so, you know, just accept it. <laughs> Growing up in a small town and moving to Saskatoon in the 60s was culture, culture personified, but I was determined this was the new start that I needed and that I had longed for, and I was just going to embrace it with all my being. Praise God, after the first difficult year of adjusting, I settled in really nicely to enjoying school, making new friends, and loving life. In grade 12, I met my husband, and to jump ahead, we have been blessed with three beautiful daughters and seven adorable grandchildren. I know you think yours are more adorable, but I know that mine are, so just let's get that straight. <laughs> and this summer, Peter and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. And we give the glory to God. It's God that's held us together, and we praise him for his faithfulness in our lives. So back to 1967, while life was good, I just thought this is the mountaintop I wanted to. Things couldn't get any better. I was just going to live on this mountaintop, but forgetting that often there's a valley 
just around the corner. And life is often lived in those valleys where we learn at the low points in our life that God is still there as he promised to never leave us or forsake us. Wallowing in the joys in life, I was in no way prepared for the approaching valley just ahead. My oldest brother was finishing up fourth year engineering and was just engaged to a fourth year home ec student. The anticipation of a wedding in the near future and getting a sister that I'd always longed for because I grew up with two brothers was just looming over the horizon. Little did I know that my so good life would fall apart and our family would be shattered into a million pieces. That year, November 1st, my 22-year-old brother, Ron, woke up with chest pains. And as we prepared to take him to the hospital, because there was no 911, my dad managed to get him out to the car and started CPR on him as we waited for the ambulance to arrive. We found out later that all this time, even though it was a matter of only minutes, Ron's heart had been starved of the blood supply to keep him alive. So my happy, fun-loving, caring brother that I was so close to died, basically, right before our eyes. By the time the ambulance came and got him to the, got him to the hospital, they worked on him for a whole hour before they finally pronounced him dead. Later, later, we were to find out that his main artery to his heart became plugged and thus starving his heart of the much-needed blood to keep him alive. The doctors said it is so rare they will never see it again in their practicing lifetime. No, God, this happens to other families, and it had happened to other families. It doesn't happen to our family. No, God. Please just let it be a nightmare or a bad dream that we're going to wake up from. No, God, please, please don't take my brother from me and my family. It was too late. He was already gone. Our family fell apart, and I mean literally fell apart in devastating ways. Although it was a time to pull together, I think that our family did the complete opposite. The support of family and friends was a huge comfort, but soon they dispersed and got on with their lives. There was no counseling, no help to process what had happened, no encouragement that life can go on. So what do you do? You're told to shake it off, suck it up. Life's hard, get on with living. Get, get on with life was the last thing that we wanted to do because it felt like an insult to the life and memory of our dearly departed loved one. My other brother, Les, went back to working at his job out of town, me back to university, which I now hated because I knew Ron wasn't there, and my parents back to work. I remember just dying on the inside, not wanting life to go on. And to add to that, my mom's and dad's devastation of losing their precious son, their firstborn. This really sent my mom into a, stales, a tailspin as she already was struggling with some mental health issues. Devastation was to be expected, absolutely. But somehow in the depth of their own grief, they seemed to forget that I too was grieving. Bless my dad who tried to keep some measure of peace in the house, but he became consumed with trying to keep my mom happy with her many challenges and now this, but he carried it to an unhealthy extreme. This was a destructive pattern in our family as one person, my mom, had so much power. We were raised to keep my mom happy, no matter any personal cost to us. 
Somehow being the only one at home, I was right in her line of fire. Maybe she was angry that I had lived, but turn against me, she did. This pattern went on for many years, leaving again much destruction in its path. After many years of being a stay-at-home mom, almost 14, I was blessed with a job in our church office, a job that I love and I only retired from. It's almost one year now. Bookkeeping and numbers, they're just my thing. Many years earlier, Peter decided that 35 years of dealing with people's unemployment insurance was enough. No one ever seemed to be happy with benefits, or at least that we heard of, and it was taking its toll on him. So he decided to retire, gave back three years of accumulated sick time that he had not used because he was hardly ever sick, to find out two years later that he had cancer. Another hit I didn't see coming or was prepared for. He was hardly ever sick, and now this. Surgery followed very quickly, and then a round of chemo that nearly took his life and followed by radiation. It left him with limitations that are hard to accept and a long healing process. But praise God, he saw us through. He had never left us or forsaken us. And I am thrilled to tell you today, Peter is a 15-year cancer survivor, and he drives people to their treatments now, and he has been able to help so many people talk about God that can turn something bad into something good. Although, although relations with my parents were poor, one day I felt this urgency to go and see my parents. They lived across the parking lot from where I worked. But previous to this, I just want to tell you before I go there, that on a Sunday morning, the pastor shared on forgiveness, asking people to stand and to make a public declaration that there was someone in their life that they needed and wanted to forgive. I stood so declaring that I wanted to forgive my mom, although I was thunderstruck as what to do next. So I asked the pastor, and I will always remember his response, wait for God to open a window. The most important things had already begun in my heart. I learned that forgiveness does not mean that the actions of anybody are right or justified. Forgiveness does not make it okay, and forgiveness never justifies their behavior, no matter their issues. Here's the good news. Forgiveness sets you free. It really does. Freedom from plans for revenge, uh, freedoms from hateful feelings, freedom from listening to Satan, Satan's accusations against us because I'd given it to God. Free to trust God to complete the forgiveness process in my life that only he can accomplish. So I had chosen the journey, and for me, it was a journey of forgiveness, especially with God's help fighting the accuser of the brother and as Satan tried to bring me down many times. So back to this overwhelming urge to see my parents. So lots had changed in my heart as forgiveness took hold. And so off I went across the parking lot. We chatted cheerfully at the door and friendly. And I had this overwhelming urge to hug them and tell them that I love them. I know this would mean so much to them. But, regrettably, I did not follow the leading of the Spirit in my life. The very next day, my mom collapsed and was pronounced dead on arrival at hospital. My mom and I never had a flourishing relationship 
but oh, how I could wish, wish I could look back on that day, knowing that the last words I said to her were, Mom, I love you, because I meant it, and I really did. I still carry that burden to this day. Wow, another sudden blow to our family. Me feeling so low that I could hardly look up. But knowing that I had forgiven my mom made all the difference in the world for me moving forward. I was dealing with Peter's recovery, my mother's death, my dad's devastation and losing his precious Betty. I was so overwhelmed one day. I just I remember it so clearly. And I just stood in my bedroom and I, I just shouted out to God and I said, where are you in all of this? The Holy Spirit instantly spoke to me. And the very first word he said was Gail. The God of the universe knows me by name. Gail, he said, I have not moved. In that instant, my perspective changed just, just that quickly. God had not deserted me in the valley. He was there all along, carrying me in the palm of his hands. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 8:38. I felt like I was on holy ground. I wanted nothing but to worship him. I knew God was with me and that he had never left me for a moment. What an amazing God we serve. I was on the mountaintop again, but it didn't matter. Mountaintop or valley, he is there. With permission, Permission, I quote my friend Tegan. I love this. In the valley is often where we find out who we really are. It is the moment where we often feel God is silent, where we are tested and tried. When we see the mountain top from a distance and dream what it would be like to reach it, and realizing one day we will look back from that very mountain top and see what he was doing all along. Did you hear that? We're going to see, we're gonna look back and see what he was doing all along. Someday we'll see him face to face and all our doubts and questions will disappear as we see what he was doing in our lives all along. So Peter got better and the Lord gave us three great years with my dad. But when my dad was in palliative care, I was never sure if he had reached out to Jesus. So spurred on by the Holy Spirit, I asked him, Dad, have you ever asked Jesus to forgive your sins? And he looked me right in the eye and he said, yes, many times. Three beautiful words that have brought me so much comfort as the very next day my dad went to meet our Jesus. Recently, I retired from a bookkeeping job at the church, a very big adjustment after 30 years, and I still miss it. I just miss those numbers. <laughs> I'll get over it one of these years. <laughs> The next part of my journey, some of you have already heard, but I hope that you could glean something new from it. I'm going to share my journey to mental wellness. More than a decade ago, when I was visiting my doctor, he picked up on something that was very wrong. He gave me a little test on which I score 14, and I think the average is usually about four. So he said, Gail, it's time. And thus, I started my very private, very personal journey taking medication for depression. 
a journey I did not even initially share with Peter and actually only very recently shared with our daughters. Why? I was ashamed. I was so very ashamed. The stigma was so great, but I also knew that something was very, very off and that I needed some help. Why is it any different than any other disease? If you have to take insulin for diabetes, why is it so different if you have to take something to help you for your, with your mental health? After in retiring, I thought I didn't need the medication anymore and thinking I heard from God. Did you catch that? <laughs> thinking I heard from God. I decided that I was just going to step out, I was just going to can the medication, no extra prayer, no seeking God. I just knew I wanted to be off them, and I wanted him to heal me so I could carry on normally. So this, this must really have been from God. It just had to be. It just had to be. The first few days, or maybe the week, they were, yeah, they were pretty good. But as time went on, I could feel myself slip, slipping first here, and then there, and then almost everywhere. I fought it with all I was worth. But one day I realized I was going to lose this battle as my anxiety level grew. I said things without thinking, lack of confidence, not wanting to make decisions, poor judgment, unable to think clearly, not functioning on all cylinders, pressure in my brain, and regrettably, but they were there, so I admit them, suicidal thoughts. The Lord had given me a verse, Psalm 128, verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Revive means to restore from a depressed and inactive and unused state, to renew in the mind and the memory. This is what I needed, to be revived and renewed in my mind. And here was the verse, right in front of me. God was going to do it for me. I just needed to wait on him. So while waiting, I read and memorized scripture, listened to Christian music. I also told myself I would not accept defeat. I am healed. He said he would revive me. This can't be happening. Just trust God. Just try to relax and things will get better. Do you, do you ever try to relax? That you put so much effort in relaxing and you put so much pressure on yourself that you actually become more tense? That was me. That was me. Life was spiraling out of control. Only sleeping brought me relief, and I aimed for 10 to 12 hours and easily achieved that every night because it was my only escape from life and from reality. Even though the Lord met and ministered to me in many gracious ways, I whispered his name over and over, always being renewed and revived. But life was still spiraling out of control. I just longed to feel normal. I'll never be able to shut off my mind. My mind was like one of those little creatures, you know, that runs around, around, around on the treadmill. But it never allowed me to get off. So one day I cried out to God and I asked him, when is this going to end and his healing be complete in my mental state? No answer. But he did drop into my remembrance how I felt when I was on the medication. Clear head, less anxiety, better coping skills. Could this be his answer for me? To go back on the medication I fought so hard to be off? So I admitted that I was a 100% complete failure and reassured myself that I could never be used by God. Not now. Not in any way. I decided to go back on the meds. The stigma of this, this was almost more than I could bear, but I stuck with it faithfully every day. And guess what? 
I started to feel better. That revival and renewal of my mind that I so longed for. Yes, I'm still on medication, maybe forever. No, I was not healed as I so wanted to. But in God's way, I really was. It was just his way, not my way. And I'd just like to add here that God has opened up so many doors for me to tell my story because I wasn't healed. That would not have happened if I had been healed. Life is good, back on track. Not to say that I don't ever have a bad day as I do, but I just go back to Psalms 128 verse 7. He will revive me and I leave him to do the work in me. Praise God, I'm coping well, I'm happy, I live a full, satisfied life, the life God had for me all along. Please don't judge me or anyone who struggles with mental wellness. Yes, we love Jesus. Yes, we can be used by him. Yes, we know he's the only way. Remember, for us, coping in the middle of this is very real and very terrifying. Please offer acceptance, even if you don't totally understand, because you've never struggled in this area. For those who know what I'm talking about, let us be the body of Christ to share our struggles. Be real with one another. Be vulnerable. Let us break down the stigma of living with mental wellness. Let us be sisters in Christ who encourage and support and nurture each other with honesty and openness. Another quote. Let us be the kind of sisters that help straighten each other's crown without even letting that sister know or the world that it was even crooked. I praise God for good doctors that are willing to address mental wellness. I praise God for good medication that adjusts chemical imbalance in our minds and are used by God to renew our minds and restore us from depression. I praise God for giving me the courage to be open and vulnerable and real by sharing my story. My prayer is that even if there is one person here tonight that telling my story helps, I'll be thrilled. My prayer as I share my journey, the personalized journey that God has for me, will help you recognize the personalized journey that God has for you. Let's break down the stigma attached to mental wellness. Whatever path he chooses for you to walk, the Lord walks with you. Hold your head high and rejoice that the God of the universe knows your name. He knows your every thought. He does not leave us in the valley al alone and deserted. He is with us there, and in time, he will lift us up and out. I'm no longer ashamed of my journey. I am no longer ashamed to stand against the stigma of mental wellness. His great plan with my personal name on it to revive and renew me. May you be revived and renewed as you go forth in him. His plan exactly designed for you. The word says that we're given life and that we're to live it abundantly. Let's live it. Let's live it with abundance. There's much to do. There's much to be accomplished in our families and in this world, and for the kingdom. Then, and there's so much waiting for us on the other side. But let's get excited. Let's get excited about the here and now. I'm excited what God is doing in me. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's get busy, sisters, and move forward in him, the one who knows us. By name. I would like to have the privilege of praying with you. 
So if you would bow with me. Father God, thank you that you know our name. Every single person in this room is known by you personally, by name. We're not just a random person on this planet, but you, Lord, have a plan for our lives, designed perfectly for us. May we trust you to rest in that plan. Let us forgive. Let us let go of deep hurts, no matter how hard it is as you'll help us on that journey through forgiveness and freedom in you and thus being set free ourselves. Lord, we all struggle in many areas. Let us accept the journey you have us on, knowing that you are right there as close as a mention of your name. Mountaintop or valley, you're holding us in your hand, in the very palm of your hand. We long for the day to see you face to face, but meanwhile, there's much to be done as we serve God, the God that calls us by name. And in your precious name and for your glory, amen.